Okay, first of all, thank you all for coming today. I really do appreciate all of your time. Um, before I get into it, I want to start with a question to you guys, or a bit of a survey, and just to make sure everybody's participating. I want everybody in the room to put one hand up in the sky. Thank you. And I want you to put your hand down. Not yet. I want you to put your hand down if you've seen the Milky Way with your naked eye. Keep your hands up if you've never seen the Milky Way with your naked eye. If you've never seen the Milky Way with your naked eye, put your hands up. So it's about a third of you, which is quite interesting, because a recent study showed that a third of the world's population will never get to see the Milky Way with their naked eye. And about 70% of the British population now live in an area where you cannot see the Milky Way. I mean, there's a... There's an observatory in London, the Royal Observatory of Greenwich, which seems quite baffling now because London's one of the most light-polluted places in the country. But just a little bit over 100 years ago, everybody in the UK, and in fact everybody in the entire world, could comfortably see the Milky Way with their naked eye from the comfort of their own garden. If you're in North America, that figure is 80%. So 80% of Americans now live in an area where you cannot see the Milky Way. And there's a funny story where... Uh, in 1994, an earthquake in Los Angeles caused a power outage and the emergency services that morning were inundated with calls of a weird cloud in the sky. And people were terrified. They thought aliens were coming. But that weird cloud turned out to be the Milky Way. They'd never seen it before. They didn't have no idea what was going on. And people were terrified, which is quite hilarious. I don't know if you can see that image. It's quite bright in here. Can we turn the lights off? That's what this talk is about. It's about turning the bloody lights off. <laughs> um, but this is a, a composite image. It's not a real image. This is a sort of Photoshop creation just to show uh, what it would have looked like on that day in, in 1994. Um, but it's quite funny to be scared of the Milky Way. Uh, for me, it's part and parcel of my job to get out in dark places and capture photographs of the Milky Way. I'm a self-employed landscape astrophotographer uh, and this is a, a typical image of mine uh, and this was taken in the Brecon Beacons, my backyard as it were and so you have this earthbound scene, in this case Penavan, the tallest mountain in South Wales and then you've got this star studded sky and of course the Milky Way line in the sky there. Um, but it's not just the stars in the Milky Way that are on my hit list, I also spend time hunting the Northern Lights and uh, this was an image I took in Norway uh, at the beginning of this year, and I'm sure it's something that's on the bucket list of pretty much everyone in this room if you haven't seen it already. Uh, other than the Northern Lights, there are also meteor showers throughout the course of the year. Uh, this is one of the more popular ones in December. It's called the Geminid Meteor Shower. Uh, and this photograph, which I took in La Palma in the Canary Islands, in captures all of the meteors I caught in the space of six hours. So I left my camera taking photographs for six hours and then you can see all of the meteors in those six hours in one single photograph and of course you can see the Milky Way and I was above the clouds, you can see the cloud inversion there. And there are some more obscure things that you may not be aware of, for example in this image here you can see a triangular diffused glow of light, a very faint light uh, this is something called the zodiacal light, and it's actually a band of dust and rocks in the same plane as the planets. And they reflect the sunlight back into the night sky. So the sun has just set, and this band of dust and rocks is reflecting the light of the sun back into the night sky. And we can only see it during spring and autumn for an hour before sunrise or an hour after sunset, and it's very, very faint. Um, but there are some more, even more faint objects in this image. If you look just here, you'll see a little cluster of stars called Pleiades, commonly known as the Seven Sisters. And that thing is 444 light years away from Earth. So it's taken the light from those stars 444 years, traveling across space before landing on my camera sensor. And you may also notice a little smudge of a disk there. That's actually Andromeda. Um, our closest galactic neighbour, a spiral galaxy, and that thing is 2.5 million light years away. So it's taken the light from that galaxy 2.5 million light million years to travel across space and into my camera. And if there was somebody living on a planet orbiting a star in Andromeda looking back and photographing us, 
they would have a very similar picture because our galaxy, the Milky Way, is also uh, a spiral galaxy. But we are losing our dark skies at an alarming rate. You can see from this image from the International Space Station, you can very clearly see the United Kingdom because we have completely illuminated all of our streets uh, and roads and cities and towns. Um, quite fortunately in Wales you can see there's still a lot of dark skies left in mid Wales. Um, but this next fact that I'm about to explain to you is rather terrifying. In the, in, the, in the 50 years since humans landed on the moon, the human population has more than doubled. So within a lifetime, within the lifetime of my parents, for example, the human population has more than doubled from 3 billion to now nearly 7 billion. And what that means, of course, is that towns and cities are getting bigger, they're getting brighter, and of course electricity now is far more accessible and far more reliable than it ever has been. So we're very much losing darkness, uh, and this has many detrimental impacts on wildlife. I mean, if an owl can fly as silently as possible, it doesn't matter because it's been illuminated by artificial lights, and its prey can see it coming from a mile away, and the prey will escape, and the owl will go hungry. And of course, owls are not the only predators that rely on darkness to hunt. There are foxes, there are badgers, there are hedgehogs, there are moths, there are bats, there are insects. There's a wide range of predators who rely on darkness to hunt, who are now going hungry because we've illuminated the arena. This pretty harrowing image here of dead birds being arranged artistically is something created by the Fatal Light Awareness Program in Toronto. They do this once a year with all of the dead birds they've collected over the space of a year to bring awareness to the birds which are dying as a direct result of light pollution. Migratory birds are being drawn off course from their migration patterns and they're being sucked into these glowing towns and cities where they face predators that they're not normally used to facing. And one of the bigger problems is that the glare of the lights means that they end up flying into buildings plummet into the pavement down below and, and losing their lives. And what they found in Toronto is that if you multiply the numbers found in Toronto alone with all of the similar sized cities in America, millions of birds are dying a year with a direct link to light pollution. And that's in North America alone. You've got to multiply that then by the rest of the world. The numbers are absolutely staggering. But there's a more sinister problem, not just the sheer rate and expansion and growth of light pollution. There's a, a new problem that we've been facing in recent years that has far more serious implications. And in this image, which I took from a helicopter flying over Swansea in South Wales, you can see two distinct forms of lights. You have the yellow sodium-based bulbs um, that we've been used to the past few decades. And when you now see this blue, almost white light, coming from what we call the LED revolution. The old sodium bulbs are now being replaced with these almost white LEDs. Now LEDs or light emitting diodes are little bulbs which are extremely cheap to manufacture, they're cheap to run, they use less energy, so technically they're good for the planet because a lot of our energy still comes from burning fossil fuels unfortunately. So they sound like these wonderful things and councils are now replacing streetlights at a pretty fast pace with these new LEDs. Um, but one of the problems we found is that they are so cheap to run that councils are replacing one sodium base bulb with multiple of the LEDs. So whereas there was one big yellow bulb, they now have five or six LED lights replacing that one bulb. And Another big problem with these LEDs is that they are very rich in blue light. If you look at the, the old sodium based bulbs at the top, they only emitted sort of amber and yellow light. But these new LEDs are a mixture of blue, green and red. And it's the blue that's causing a huge problem. In terms of light pollution, it's far more light polluting. Our atmosphere, our sky scatters blue light far easier than any other color of light. It's the reason the sky is blue in the daytime, because the blue light of the sun is being scattered. And so we find that these LEDs are far more light polluting. Even though they're using less energy, the light of the LEDs is far more light polluting. And as an astrophotographer, I could deal with the old sodium-based bulbs. 
There's a glass called Dididium glass that was invented for glass workers who, when they heat up the glass to shape it, they burn and ignite the sodium inside the glass and causes this bright amber glare. So they created this glass called Dididium glass which filters out yellow light and amber light and that way the glass worker can see through the glare and see the glass that he's working on. And this glass found its way into the astrophotography world so we could stick this glass in front of our lens. Uh, and this is an image from the Brecon Beacons. You can see a lot of yellow light pollution on the horizon. And then with the filter, it's reduced. You can see the yellow light in the foreground completely gets removed. And so we could filter out that yellow light and get a little bit of better detail in the night sky and things like the Milky Way. But we can't do that with the LEDs because they're full of blue, green and red light. And if we filter all that colours out, we're not left with an image. You might as well just put your lens cap on. It's the same thing. But there's implications with the blue light and wildlife as well. And there was a recent study in the University of Exeter that showed that moths are far more attracted to blue rich light compared to the amber lights. And so around these white lights, you're seeing a flutter of, of moths and there's a huge feast for bats. Uh, but there's one species of bat called the myotis, commonly known as the mouse-eared bat, which is instinctively avoiding the lights and the feast of the moths because there are larger, faster flying bats in the area that prey on these bats. Uh, so we're seeing now in areas that have switched to these white LEDs, the, the number of mouse-eared bats is, is decreasing and dwindling. Perhaps the better understood, the most, the best understood case of blue light causing an issue in wildlife is with the sea turtles, which are very much endangered. And sea turtles lay their eggs on beaches, and when the hatchlings come out of the shell, they find their way to the sea by looking for moonlight reflecting on the waves. And what we're finding now is in these built-up areas that have LED street lighting, the hatchlings are turning around and going towards the streets rather than going to the sea, and of course they're losing their lives. And it's quite drastic because the sea turtles are endangered. And even if there's about 10,000 eggs laid on one beach, only less than 100 will actually make it to, to full adulthood. And it's something I've experienced firsthand in a place called Kabak in Turkey, which I visit every year. And 10, 20 years ago, there was virtually nothing in this valley. But now as tourism has boomed, there are more campsites and hostels and hotels. And it's starting to glow like a small city at night. Uh, and the sea turtles there now require human intervention to make sure that they make it to the sea. So people are keeping an eye on the eggs every night and when they hatch, they have to collect them into buckets and make sure they get into the sea. Um, but there was a recent case study in Florida who had the exact same issue. And so they replaced all of the street lightings with amber LEDs, so orange colored LEDs, and they reduced the power so they were nice and dim. And they found that in the areas that they did this, the disorientation rate of the baby sea turtles was reduced to zero. So there's a direct link between the color found in the light and the disorientation of the sea turtles. And it's not just wildlife as well, it's humans. Now humans and wildlife alike have spent millions of years evolving based on this continuous cycle of night and day, of darkness and lightness. And we have something called circadian rhythms which controls our hormones and what we find is that the the sensitivity of the circadian rhythm which is this dotted line here uh, is very much within the blue color the blue spectrum of light and these blue rich LEDs you can see with a thick black line is very much affecting our circadian rhythms and so what you find is that people who have had these LEDs installed outside their bedroom windows on the streets they're struggling to sleep and the reason being is that a lack of blue light triggers the production of something called melatonin. Melatonin is a chemical that is responsible for making you sleepy. And exposure to this blue light means that your body doesn't produce melatonin and you struggle to sleep and your circadian rhythm is completely thrown off. Uh, and there are far more serious implications when your circadian rhythm is, is messed up with and you, there are links to heart disease, to depression, uh, and to a number of cancers, in particular breast cancer, there's a strong link between a lack of melatonin uh, and breast cancer. So there's some serious uh, risks and issues with, with humans as well. And we're only now starting to uncover the problems because it's very much a new problem. And we haven't had enough time to put the research into it. And beyond just the physical health of humans, it's also the psychological health of humans. So the night sky has been a source of inspiration for artists, for poets, for musicians, 
for writers for, for centuries now. And um, a recent study in California in the University of Berkeley showed that spending a night under the stars, um, subjects scored higher on tests of scientific reasoning, uh, and they were also shown to be more altruistic, less materialistic, uh, and far more kind and positive as people as well. So we, we're losing something that's incredibly valuable to us. Um, and something that's very beneficial to our health as well. So what can be done? Uh, fortunately, there are some organizations. Uh, the one I work closely with is the International Dark Sky Association. And they are responsible for awarding the statuses of Dark Sky Reserve to the Brecon Beacons. Uh, Snowdonia National Park is now a Dark Sky Reserve as well. And the Elan Valley is a Dark Sky Park. And so the local community in these areas have spent years reducing light pollution, cutting down on unnecessary lights, and measuring the quality of the skies to achieve this status, which of course brings tourism to the area, it protects the wildlife, has benefits for human health as well. Uh, so we have these organisations who are, are doing what they can. And we're quite fortunate in Wales in that almost 20% of Wales' landmass now is protected against light pollution. So I feel very fortunate to live here in Wales and we're only set to increase that amount as well as other areas in Wales are looking to achieve this dark sky status as well. The advice from the IDA is to only light when necessary, there are so many unnecessary lights out there. Uh, use amber lights for obviously the reasons that I've just explained in the past five minutes and of course to reduce the lamp power. You can plant trees to shield the light and of course planting trees is not exactly a bad thing to do. Uh, and of course you can restrict the upward light with shields. A lot of light and energy is wasted by lights that spill up into the sky and there's no need to send light up into the sky and illuminate the sky. Uh, and what does that mean for me as a photographer? Well if you look at this image taken from Chepstow of the, the Seven Estuary, you can just about make out the bright stars of the constellation Orion. Some of you might recognize the three stars that make Orion's belt. Uh, but then if you take this example from mid-Wales, Orion becomes lost in all of the other stars that you can see. It becomes clear that the Milky Way runs through that area of the night sky as well. And you can see a few meteors because on that night it was the night of the, the Leonid's meteor shower. And I feel that we as humans have a responsibility to protect wildlife. We probably should protect our own health as well. And cutting down on light pollution is good for not just the wildlife and humans, but it's good economically, it saves money, it uses less energy. And I feel that we have, um, we owe a lot to the night sky. A lot of human intelligence wouldn't be born if it wasn't for the patterns that we see in the stars. So 10,000 years ago, farmers didn't have watches or calendars or iPhones. They didn't know what day or date it was but they knew what season it was by recognizing the rising constellations at that time of year and then they knew what time they should what time of year they should plant their crops based on the stars that they could see the shipfarers who traveled the world navigated by using the stars and even today astronomers still look out and learn stuff about the universe that is extremely useful and beneficial uh, to us here on earth and so I'd like to thank you all for coming today. I hope you found it useful and uh, educational. And turn all the bloody lights off. <laughs> Thanks very much.